Fun facts. My name is Prachi. The Disney villain of Little Mermaid, Ursula, was in fact inspired by the iconic gay drag queen Divine, and this is a video in which I anti-haul things that I really, really want to buy. Today's fun fact was inspired by the legendary queen who revolutionized beauty anti-consumerism on YouTube, Kimberly Clark. When will Miss Kimberly Clark return to us from the war? So this video is scheduled to post on the second to last day of March, and I know some of you were probably expecting my March check-in because of that, but I'm gonna be real with you lads. I do not have the emotional bandwidth to try and process the month of March right now. I have papers due, and I'm just barely being held together by like five hours of sleep, a smile, green eyeshadow, and copious amounts of caffeine. None of that is enough for me to be able to coherently talk about the complicated feelings I have had during the month of March. Because March as a month was just... Hello darkness, my old friend. I don't know Yeah. So instead of trying to reflect on whatever that was right now, I just wanted to do something light and fun and kind of escapist and purely beauty oriented. An anti-haul. The twist is that instead of it just being me like roasting new releases, I'm actually going to try to talk myself out of things I've really, really wanted to buy since I've gone on my no-buy year. This version of an anti-haul has been done like a bunch of times, I'm sure, but the first one that I ever recalled seeing was the collab between Nisa Nisipisa and Hannah Smokey Glow during the holiday season this past year. I'll link both their videos below. Without any further ado, here's... What I'm not gonna buy. Let's get it! The first product on the list is actually one of those Sephora kits. What's inside the kit are mini sizes of the Smashbox Photo Finish Primerizer, the Milk Makeup Highlighter in Lit, NARS Orgasm Blush, the Bobbi Brown Vitamin Enriched Face Base Moisturizer, the Becca Hydra Mist Powder, and then a full size of those Tarte Lip Rescue Lip Balms. This is one of those things that to me felt like almost unjust. Why? Because the kit's $35 Canadian, and it contains four products that I've really, really wanted to try. The Smashbox Primerizer, the Milk Highlight, Bobbi Brown Vitamin Enriched Face Base, and that Becca Powder. Moreover, this is a thing that financially kind of makes sense, because the mini sizes of the Primerizer and the Milk Highlight are available and sold separately, and the cost of those two mini size products that I individually would have bought on my own add up to $35, which is the cost of this entire kit. So for $35, not only am I getting those two products I would have bought anyway, it would also let me try out a mini size of the Becca Hydra Mist Powder, which is something that I've heard really good things about, and the Bobbi Brown Vitamin Enrich Face Base, which is the thing that I hear everybody raving about all the time. It's like people whose opinion I really trust, like Hannah Smoky Glow. So this kit is a good deal. It's one of those like rare times where it's like a thing that you already always wanted to buy, like happens to go on sale. It's like a bunch of stuff that I already always wanted to try is put into like a kit that's actually of good value. But here's the thing, like when I actually really drill down into the products that I really, really want to try, I have so many primers and I don't even really use primers. And so then adding two mini sizes of two different primers to my collection seems like folly. I don't even know if I like using primers. I feel like I like the idea of a primer more than I do primer itself. Like I like the promises of a primer. I like that primers promise that they're going to give me like excellent skin and a flawless foundation application and I'm never going to look scaly or rough or textured or greasy or anything. But I never actually take the time to put them on as a step. I already have so many skincare steps in the morning that I feel like are a better return on my investment than wearing a primer, quite frankly. I also have like nine lip balms that I need to go through. I don't need this like full size one from Tarte. I have a bunch of powders already. That Becca one I think is permanent, so I guess like when I burn through all of my powders, it's still there for me to try. And then when it comes to like the mini size milk makeup highlighter in Lit, I have two other stick highlighters that I would be devastated if they went bad before I finish them up. And adding in this like third cream product into the mix, like, and the elephant in the room, I have bought and decluttered NARS Orgasm Blush before. 
The color barely showed up on my cheeks. Like it was just this like fine wash of gold shimmer. I saw no coral, no pink, no like nothing. Like it was just like putting glitter on my face. And here's the weird thing. Like tell me what's wrong with me that even though I have bought, used, disliked, and decluttered NARS orgasm before, some part of me still thinks that this time is gonna be different. This time it'll show up on my skin because all of the people in the world and the universe who love NARS Orgasm Blush, for whom NARS Orgasm is their holy grail, they couldn't possibly have been wrong. Surely I had to be doing something wrong. Surely I'm just using it incorrectly. This time, this time it's gonna work. Sweetie, Prachi, it's not. Like stop trying to make NARS Orgasm happen. Anyway, it's my no buy year, so I will not be buying that kit. I don't need that kit. Okay, so my next item is like a much broader, bigger umbrella category, and it's one of those things that would actually be like a good or justified purchase, and that's the category of green eyeshadows. Now, why would this have been justified or good? Because at the start of my no buy year, I had precisely one green eyeshadow. I want more green eyeshadows. I don't know if it's the fact that last year, after 15 plus years of being sorted into Ravenclaw House on every single possible sorting quiz, including the official Pottermore website, I took this like full Pottermore quiz that had every single question and it like broke down what percentage of your answers equated with which house. And it turns out I'm actually perfectly evenly split between Ravenclaw and Slytherin, with Slytherin edging ahead by 2%. So I don't know if this is some sort of like Hogwarts house inspired identity crisis that's triggering my urge for brighter and more bold green eyeshadows. As a side note, I would like to take a moment here to state that the Harry Potter novels and movies were like a key part of my formative childhood and teenage years. They have informed me and helped me grow and stretch in a myriad of different ways and they will never lose their specialness and their dear place in my heart. However, as far as I'm concerned, we're going with the literary theory of the death of the author. Like I am absolutely unconcerned with anything that comes out of her mouth regarding the Harry Potter world. I would much rather read about Ebony, Darkness, Dementia, Raven, Way, and her love affair with Draco Malfoy than listen to one other thing about the Harry Potter world from JK Rowling's mouth. Just thought I should make it clear where I stand on that issue. Back to makeup. I have, for some reason, really, really been wanting green eyeshadows for several months now, and I've basically been obsessing over every single green eyeshadow palette that's come my way, so that's what we're gonna discuss here now. First off, it was the Melt Smoke Sessions. Now, the fact that it's like all about like weed or whatever, like that's like a non-issue for me. Like I, I wasn't like excited about it. I don't hate it either because I have never smoked weed in my life and I don't care. I just thought the colors were really, really pretty, especially that like right half of the palette where you have those beautiful frosty shimmery greens, like that's what I want. Here's why I'm not going to be getting that palette. Shipping to Canada is ridiculous. Duties to Canada, are ridiculous. Also, that palette is $48 and it's not available anywhere in the world for me to touch and swatch. $48 is a lot of faith to place in a palette that I will like that formula. Returning things by mail from Canada is ridiculously expensive. And so that's kind of like tempered or killed my desire for the Smoke Sessions palette. So then I kind of moved on to the Huda Beauty Emerald Obsessions palette. That idea of having like a cute, small, monochromatic palette, like that's appealing to me. I like that. But the reviews for the Huda Beauty eyeshadows are kind of like hit or miss. I also don't know how I feel about the Huda Beauty as a whole. Like the more I kind of like look into what Huda Beauty has done, the more I'm sort of like uncomfortable giving her a bunch of my money. So, and not to gloss over the, the ethics of maybe supporting Huda Beauty to something much more superficial, but Every single time I've ever stepped into a Sephora, all of the testers for her eyeshadow palettes look a mess. Like it seems like shades are crumbling or falling apart or whatever. And that worries me as a person who travels a lot with my makeup. The fact that eyeshadows might like crumble apart and shatter and just cause like a huge mess in my makeup bag. Ugh. And then right as I was in the middle of having this like life crisis over whether I wanted to buy Huda Beauty products or not, ColourPop came out with the Just My Luck palette. And I was like, yes, those shimmery shades. And ColourPop palettes are really well priced. I have some of their eyeshadow palettes. I don't mind the formula. I think they perform pretty well on my eyes. So like 
this is kind of perfection. But here's the really weird thing about having been fixated on green eyeshadows for a really long time and then obsessively wanting first the smoke sessions and then the Huda Beauty Emerald palette and now this ColourPop eyeshadow palette. I've realized waiting and not giving into your desire to buy something at the very moment at which it seems like a good idea to buy something is incredibly powerful. If I had just given in to my desire to buy green eyeshadows at the exact moment at which I really wanted to buy green eyeshadows, I would have totally bought either the Smoke Sessions palette and paid all of those like shipping and duties and all that kind of stuff, or I would have bought that Huda Beauty Emerald Obsessions palette. And then, like a month and a half later, ColourPop would have come out with pretty much the exact same thing at a much lower price point in a formula that I actually enjoy, and I'd have just been like, what did I spend pretty much $50 for? And that's sort of been keeping me strong throughout the anti-haul year. Because let's say that my love for green eyeshadows is in fact an enduring love. I'm inclined to think that it is because I've been feeling this way for like two and a half to three months now. I'm just thinking about by the end of my no buy, how many more beautiful and incredible green eyeshadow products might come out. And that leads me to my second point, which is that having this period of like just waiting and really evaluating whether I want a thing or not has made me think more critically about what it is I actually wanted out of the Smoke Sessions palette, out of the Huda Emerald Obsessions palette, and out of ColourPop Just My Luck. And when I really stop and think about it, I'm only really attracted to like one or two shades in each of those palettes. It's always that very, very bright, vibrant, shimmery Kelly Green that attracts me because I want to use it wet as an eyeliner to create like a winged liner and then do like a thinner black wing underneath it to have that sort of like beautiful pop of color right on the edge of my line. And so having had this period where I'm really, really forced to wait means I've been able to kind of look with a critical eye at these eyeshadow palettes that I, I would have so wanted like a month ago and be like, actually, I don't want a bunch of those colors. I just want like one right from the get. And I think that's maybe why even if you're not on a no buy, the process of anti-hauling is like really, really important because it forces you to stop and really think critically about what exactly it is that you want out of a particular thing that you want to buy and can it give it to you and is it the best thing to give that to you the next product that i wanted to put into this anti-haul is actually a fragrance it's by diptyque it's called philosikos which means lover of figs in greek and figs is basically what this perfume is all about so some context on why i want philosikos so much fruity fragrances as a general rule smell horrible on me. Not to me, but on me. I just really want to clarify that I love the way a fruity fragrance smells on somebody else, but when I put it on my own body... Have you ever been to a fruit market on the end of a very hot summer's day? The sun's been bearing down on the fruits for hours, and the heat makes the air smell so sickeningly sweet and cloying almost like the fruits are beginning to rot. That's what happens to fruity notes whenever they end up on my body. They just don't seem to mesh well with my body chemistry, and so I was never really tempted to even try out Philosikos because I was like, going around smelling like rotting figs? It's not really the vibe I want to be putting out into this world. However, there was like this little like fragrance event happening at the mall that I walk through every single day on my way to university. And Diptyque kind of had like a display or whatever that I was walking past and the lady smelled so exquisite and she was like, oh, what I'm wearing is Philosikos. And I was so like enamored by the way she smelled that against my better judgment, I was like, you know what, like spray it on my wrists, we'll give it a shot. And then I went on my day fully expecting that one hour into this perfume being on my skin, I would just smell like a bunch of rotting figs. But behold, I smelled incredible. I cannot describe adequately the way in which I so loved the way Philosico smelled on me. I felt like I had just spent like several hours climbing like fig trees and just being surrounded by the scent of fig leaves and eating figs and just this perfume, which was super fresh without being citrusy in any way, shape or form, was a revelation. But here's the thing, I own a lot of perfumes already. I don't own like a billion bottles, but I own 
enough perfume to last me throughout the entirety of this year and maybe even into the next summer. And perfumes are a thing that go bad. The oil in them essentially degrades to where you're functionally just putting like alcohol on your skin. I've had that happen to me and I don't want that for the rest of my fragrances. I chose all of them with great care and I want to use them up. And spending so much money on a diptyque fragrance, which is truly like a luxury item, I would want to make sure that I don't have it in rotation with like five other fragrances and switch around so frequently that one day suddenly I open up the diptyque bottle to find that I've only used about half of it and the scent has gone off. Like, did I love the way Filosico smelt? Yes. Did I think it was a very special fragrance on me? Yes. Is there anything like it in my current perfume collection? No. That doesn't mean I need to go out and buy it. I should pay more attention to the things that I already have and give them their space and their time and their due. The way in which I feel about Philosikos, which keep in mind, I only tried one time, feels just like a very like intense crush or love at first sight. Not to like personify makeup, but like when you buy makeup, you're basically like moving it into your space and into your house. I would not ask somebody I like met and fell in love with like yesterday to move into my house. Like no, that has to be like a careful, calculated, well-considered, decision. And that is how I want to approach all of my makeup buying from now on. No like passing fancy, no like I saw it one time and I was like love struck and was like I just had to have it. We're thinking, we are considering, we are like looking at the long game, we are giving ourselves some time and some space to evaluate stuff before we ask it to move into my house. I feel like I just got really dramatic over makeup. Now having said all of that, here is an item I'm putting on my anti-haul that I know is not a passing fancy. She and I are in love. Bobbi Brown Crushed Lipstick in Telluride. I almost asked my friend to buy it for my birthday in January 2018 before ultimately asking for a gift card that I used to buy a foundation, a more pressing need at that time, instead. All of which is to say that I have been obsessed with getting this lipstick for well over a year now. I have swatched it, tried it on. Telluride is exactly what I want my everyday lip color to be. It's this like beautiful, blotted, reddish, mauvey brown. It's perfect. She is not a passing fancy. She is one of my great lipstick loves. But I have known this for a while. And even before my no buy, I haven't allowed myself to buy Telluride. And it's been for a very good reason. I own too many lipsticks. I am one of those people who would absolutely hate if a lip product went bad before I could finish using it up. Now some people can just let it slide because they look at almost like a cost per use and if they've only used a lipstick like 10 or 15 times before it expired, they think that it's worth it. I am not one of those people. I feel like I need to have used a lipstick like a hundred times minimum. Like I need to have seen significant progress in order for that lipstick to go bad and then for me to not feel terrible and like I've just wasted things. Like a part of it I'm sure is that I'm a student and so like it's really important for me to feel like I financially got my money's worth out of things. But there's like another more like mushy or philosophical part of me that is like every single lipstick I own I have decided to keep after an intense decluttering process. Lipstick is one of those categories where I have like really whittled down to just some of like my favorite lipsticks. The idea of somehow not having properly used all of these beautiful special lipsticks to their fullest potential before they expire. The idea that I have let that beautiful special thing go to waste is too terrible for me to bear. Am I being melodramatic? Yeah, but like that's sort of how I feel about it. Like it's a beautiful thing. It deserves to be used to its fullest. And, and part of that means like I cannot just be buying a bunch of lipsticks that would fall into the same category. Because lipstick to some extent is a zero sum game. On accepting the rare occasions in which I'm combining lipsticks, every single time I reach for one lipstick, all of the other ones aren't getting used. And so although I deeply love Telluride, she has no equal in my collection in terms of her formula and her texture, but in terms of the effect she would give, oh my god, I'm really calling this lipstick a she. 
in terms of the effect that lipstick would give, it would basically be a my lip but better lipstick. I would wear Telluride in all of the occasions in which I would be wearing a my lip but better lipstick. And when I look into my collection at all of the lipsticks I already own, I have six, seven, eight my lip but better colors that I'm already kind of working through. So Miss Telluride will have to wait, not only until the end of my no buy, but until I've used up a lipstick or two. Okay, the second to last item that I really, really wanna buy, which I'm about to anti-haul, is the NARS Exposed Cheek Palette. Now, y'all already know, because I have brought this up at every single opportunity, blush has a hold on me in a way that almost no other makeup item does. And so when I saw the NARS Exposed Cheek Palette, I want it. Like, there's no other real way for me to just say, I just, I want it. I am such a sucker for the way in which NARS presents its palettes. The packaging is exquisite. Like the external packaging is truly one of the most beautiful things that I have ever seen. And I'm looking at the inside of the palette and I'm like, I love blush. I know I'm going to use every single color in there. Were I not on a no buy, this absolutely would be one of those things where I would place it as like a reward for the end of the semester. Like once I've finished my semester, I've turned in all of my papers, written all of my exams, I would have gone out and if that palette were still available, I would have bought it as a treat for myself because I'm like, unfortunately I'm on a no buy year and I can't do that. I have to talk myself out of it. And the way in which I'm going to do this is first and foremost, a lot of the reason why I want that makeup item is the aesthetics of the thing. The external packaging is beautiful. The way in which the blushes are presented is beautiful. However, it is a cheek palette. I do not have a vanity. I do my makeup mostly on the go. I don't even know if that palette would fit in my everyday makeup bag. And if it doesn't, that means I would only really be able to use that palette on days when I'm doing my makeup at home. So like, on the weekends and like the odd day that I don't have class or work or whatever. She doesn't deserve that. That palette doesn't deserve that. Like she deserves to be cherished and loved and used every single day by somebody. And I can't do that for her. So as beautiful as the packaging is, it's also a little too big and a little too impractical. And there's a reason why I like single blushes because they're easy to like pop into a bag. Moreover, if I really sit down and I think about it, I would use every single color in that NARS palette because I own most of the colors in that NARS palette. I have so many blushes and I'm about to say something that is like heresy for blush lovers, but the facts of life is that blush actually mostly looks the same on your cheeks. Now, before the self-proclaimed blush lovers come at me with like pitchforks, there is a big difference between using this blush and this blush because they're from totally different color families. However, there isn't really that big of a difference between this blush and this blush once you wear them shared out on your cheek. And that's just a fact. So what I did is I went on Temptalia and I looked up the color dupes for all six of the cheek products in the NARS Exposed palette. Now, first off, let's address the highlight. I already have my favorite highlighter. It's from NARS. It's in the color Fort de France. Like, that highlight isn't doing anything for me. It's the five blush products that I'm super interested in. And as it turns out, the one in the top row middle is a pretty close dupe for Warm Soul by MAC, which I own. The one in the top right, I thought was actually going to be the hardest color for me to find in my collection because I didn't actually have it, but my sister came into town a little bit back and she gave me some blushes that I had decluttered to her. One of the ones that I decided to keep was this one by NYX in the color bronzed, which Tantalia lists as a dupe. So that's the entire top row of the palette that I have functional dupes for. Bottom row of the palette, the color on the very right, Tantalia lists as a dupe, Rosy Cheeks by MAC, a color which I already own. The middle color in the bottom row, she doesn't list this as a dupe, but there is a function on her site where you're able to compare swatches of two different products. And when I compared the swatch of Kink and Kisses by Marc Jacobs with that middle color in the bottom row of the NARS Exposed Cheek Palette, the sheer dot swatch looks pretty much exactly the same. All that leaves is the color on the bottom right. Luminoso by Milani is listed as a dupe. 
I bet you a lot of you already have that blush. I used to have that blush at one point in time and then I decluttered it to my sister because I found that this blush by Burt's Bees in the color Bare Peach was very, very similar in color and a formula that I preferred. So I basically own the NARS Exposed Cheek Palette already. I just want it because it's beautiful. And if I were a different person with different finances and a different kind of lifestyle, like a person who does my makeup every day on a vanity and I had that much cash lying around and I didn't have a problem with impulse shopping, I would 100% have bought that palette purely because it is a beautiful thing. But that's not who I am. And the colors in there, I already have. So I'm going to be just fine without it. Alrighty, so the last product in this anti-haul is actually a skincare product by the Korean beauty brand Laneige, and it's their dual layer face oil. Now I've actually gone to Sephora and like tried it out and seen how it works before. What it basically is is it's a layer of oil and then a layer of like hyaluronic acid based essence like super liquidy watery. You shake it up, the two things combine, a drop is dispensed, that's like a combination of that oil and that hyaluronic acid filled serum, and then you kind of spread it out across your face. And it feels really, really good. Like I tried it out on the back of my hand, I've tried it out on my actual face before. It's this like really interesting feeling where it's like you're getting this like burst of water, but also like softness from the oil itself. The oil doesn't leave a residue, like it was a pretty well-performing product. I've especially wanted it because for some reason like the, around March April is when my skin just kind of like goes haywire. That transition in between winter and spring is when my skin just like doesn't know what's going on and it starts getting really dry and flaky and just messy. And it seemed when I put it on the back of my hand that it would at the very least kind of like help with the dryness and the roughness of my skin and it would make sure that I got equal parts hydration like water and moisture, oil. However, I resisted buying it, of course, because I'm on a no buy. I have all these other like serums and oils and stuff that I need to finish up before I'm allowed to replace that category. What I have figured out to do is I had a water-based essence. It's the Belief Hungarian Water Essence. And then I also have a bunch of face oils that I actually don't really enjoy using because I feel like they don't sink into my skin fast enough. So then I was sort of sitting about this and thinking about this and being a little like sciencey and I was like, what if it isn't that the oil in the Laneige dual layer oil is particularly special, which is why it absorbs really fast? What if the reason why it absorbs really fast, leaving behind relatively little residue, is because the oil is mixed in with the water-based serum, which allows it to just disperse more evenly across the face in a thinner layer that then gets absorbed faster because there's less of it concentrated in a particular area. Plus, it's surrounded by all of these like water-based molecules that are getting absorbed relatively quickly, right? I was like, maybe it's just the fact that they combined an oil and water serum in one that is giving that effect of like not leaving my face greasy and having the oil absorb in really fast. Now, I am not a scientist. Although I was an engineering once, but it wasn't like of the chemical variety. I don't remember anything about absorption or whatever, but on like a hunch, I decided to take like a pump of the water-based essence and two drops of like, I think it was a marula oil from The Ordinary, and I just mixed them on the back of my hand this morning and then very quickly spread it all over my face and behold, basically what I had observed happening with the Laneige dual layer face oil happened with those two products that I already owned. I figured out how to get its effects without buying it at all, which anti-haul success. And that's all, folks. I have a feeling that was a really long video. I feel like I've been talking for a very long time, so if you've stuck with me all the way to the end, thank you so, so much for watching. It felt really nice to have spent the last hour of shooting just thinking about makeup and beauty and not about the hellscape that is my march. But the semester is coming to a close, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel, and once that sort of happens I'll have a lot more time to be able to be prompt with my comments and to post the bonus videos that I want to do and all of that kind of stuff. So thank you very much also for all of you for just having been very patient with me. As always, I hope that you have a great upcoming week, and even if this week ends up becoming messy and imperfect, I hope that you're still able to create and experience some truly beautiful moments.
Bye.